review and disposition. Any changes or additions? No changes. Okay. Privilege of the floor. Um, the first one. I want to welcome all of you guys to the meeting tonight. Um, we will have this time slot allowed to share thoughts, and then we'll have another one later on in the meeting so you can hear some of the meeting and then um, share anything you want to share at that point. We just ask that you say the your name, what town you're from, and just a, it's not really a dialogue, it's you guys sharing your thoughts and then we take that into consideration with different things we have going on here. So would anyone like to say anything first or wait to the second? Sure. Uh, Stephen Bannon Thornton. Uh, in, in light of uh, some recent uh, things in the news, I'm wondering if this board and this school is a member of the New Hampshire uh, School Administrative Association. Yeah, you will let the As staff is. So this, uh, the, the, the SAU staff is a member? So the SAU staff is a member of the SAA and the school, the school board is a member of the New Hampshire School Board Association. Good. Uh, and it's, is it my understanding that um, the New Hampshire School Administrative Association, the NEA, and I don't know about the school board, but they are uh, litigants against both the state and this school in, in the ongoing uh, legal action? I'm not sure. Yes. <laughs> I'm not sure that that's part of um, this discussion. Is that right? Or am I wrong in that? Is it a discussion? I don't really understand the question. Yeah, we're, we're lost. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, you, so uh, my question is, um, the school and the school board is financially supporting um, organizations that have chosen not to litigate or negotiate with the school, but they've chosen to take it to federal courts. And I wonder if the school board in the deliberative session would uh, advise that we remove ourselves from these organizations. Uh, it is quite contrary to, you know, behavior with, uh, with organizations that interact with rural communities. So that, I guess that's my question. Uh, is, it, is it the board's intention, and you certainly don't have to ask me now, but you could do it in the deliberative session. I don't think that, uh, I, I don't think that people of my town, myself, think that it's wise to expend money with organizations that uh, fail in good faith to um, try and work with the school community instead of bringing federal lawsuits against them. That's my point. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Um, uh, is this an appropriate time to talk about the lights? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so my name is David James. I live right here in Plymouth on Upper Street. Um, I have three boys in the school system, first, second, fourth grade. Uh, I'm the president of the Plymouth Huskies football and cheer organization. Uh, in that organization, we have over 100 athletes from two cheerleading teams, two tackle teams, and 35 flag athletes. I also coach Thundercats baseball and Thundercats wrestling. So I would say that I have a pulse, certainly, on the sports community here, not as much as Coach Sam Warren and others, but um, when it comes to the facilities here at Plymouth, I just want to make sure we're thinking about and we're keeping up with the rest of the surrounding towns in the state. The, the handout certainly highlights the things that we're lacking, but because we don't have lights. Um, when I was here back in November, there was a couple comments made about the townspeople really want this, we don't need this, this is something that makes a lot of sense. And I would certainly disagree with that for a couple different reasons. I think that we certainly take pride here in Plymouth for our facilities, whether that's the transportation, doing construction downtown, the equipment that our, our highway department has, our police and fire. If you look back at the past couple of years, there has been over 20 more articles of peace, and all of them were unanimous, unanimously voted into to make sure that we're continuing to upgrade all of our facilities here. So I think that if I could just express to you how important this is to continue to keep up with that pride that we have here in the community and adding lights to the football field, in addition to redoing the soccer field and adding, adding lights to that too, is just going to continue that method that we have here in Plymouth. So 
I guess I would just make sure that I'm giving you my sort of experience that I've had here so far. Um, there is a desire to continue to um, grow all sports here in Plymouth. I can only share with you the numbers that I have in my um, program now. And I think that having lights would just enhance that. Right? We have three football teams here just at the high school. I have two football teams here myself. And then obviously the SAD. So um, sports here are alive and well, certainly. And the disappointing part is that when I got to move my practices to DNM, or well, when the process to move their practices to open this prep, because they have the fields ready, we don't. That just doesn't, you know, that, that is something that I hope we can all agree on that we should be able to fix. So I just wanted to kind of express that. Um, I certainly have a pulse on the folks that are my generation that have kids coming up through the school program now. And we are happy to spend the money on the facilities. Money is not an issue. Taxes are always going to go up. There's always going to be things that we need to spend money on. And we have continued to do that, especially for the past couple of years. So there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do that now here to put some lights on the building. So. Thank, you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, my name's Amy. I am from the town of Plymouth. I have a channel here. I wonder, I am in support of the lights 100%. I wonder if any grant opportunities have been looked at to fund the cost, because I'm sure that there's grants out there for house bill for lighting. So I just wasn't sure if that was something that the um, high school board had looked at. We haven't gotten that far, but thank you. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Yes. Yes. Hi. Uh, good evening. I'm Laura Hopkinson. I have three children here uh, within Plymouth. I live in Thornton. My son Robert Sly is a freshman. Uh, Jessica and Natalie will be coming here in the subsequent years. Uh, I come to address you tonight in support of this request for this athletic proposal. Uh, essentially, I think first lights would enhance the community engagement, increasing the attendance at the evening events, and fostering a stronger sense of school pride. Uh, this supports the role in building connections between the school and the broader community. Uh, additionally, stadium lights would improve student safety, coach safety, public safety that's visiting during after dark activities and extend opportunities for participation in sports uh, by allowing flexible scheduling. Uh, financially, this isn't just an expense, but I see it as an, events, an investment looking at the numbers. Revenue from evening games and events can help offset the initial cost, making this a, a pretty sound financial decision over time. Uh, there also are grant opportunities available, to your point, ma'am, uh, looking into it. New Hampshire's Department of Education Stronger Connections Grant uh, upon my initial review seems to offer some sort of language that might participate in offsetting the cost. Uh, Dick Sporting Goods and local businesses could also assist with the funding. Uh, one of the reasons uh, why they could assist with the funding is when we talk about overall competitive equity. So many neighboring schools or districts, as I see on this proposal written by someone who's assuming within the athletic department, talks about the statistics, uh, putting this school at a disadvantage by being a D2 school and not having these lights is also something to consider. Um, it can also attract more talent and more competitions. Uh, right now, uh, certain students may not be able to participate based off of the hours that have to be during daylight. And as you know, the days get shorter in fall and winter. If we were able to extend that beyond hours, perhaps they're not having to choose between academic activities and sporting activities, they can participate in both. Um, to your point, sir, my son played on the Huskies for six years. He's now here as well, and it was constantly an issue uh, for scheduling and practices. I've seen games forfeited, uh, potentially even you know, title type games. So I'm just here to support this request for this athletic proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. The, I don't have anything as well prepared as that. My name is Melissa. <laughs> my daughter is a freshman here. She is a JV athlete, and I was quite surprised to learn that JV athletes in this community do not get to finish their games in the fall. It was a big surprise, and while I understand the reason why we don't have the lights, we are not investing in the future athletic abilities of our kids to compete in our division if their games are getting forfeited as underclassmen. So having the lights would allow them to finish their games. It would also allow, you know, we have children in the lacrosse program, soccer programs that are club sports in the area, and we are continuously moved out of town. So I think being able to bring those kids back where the SAU can use the fields and the lights for a longer season is just going to improve the SAU athletes overall and make us more competitive as a community. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. 
Uh, most of you guys know me, Chris Sanborn, I live in Plymouth, and I teach the high school. I did speak at the uh, committee meeting, but I know all of you weren't there. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the light from a standpoint of coaches within the school and, and why we want light on the field. Uh, and I'll speak in, in terms of football, that's what I coach. Uh, but you know, we have 75 kids in our program, and across the state of New Hampshire, buses are an issue. Uh, you know, we, to get JV games and freshman games, we work really, really hard and be creative. And a lot of teams can't get buses until, you know, 3.30 maybe. You know, we played South Egan uh, two years ago, three times in JV. They could only get a bus at 3.30, so we didn't have lights. We had to go down there three times to play. You know, they couldn't come up here because we just wouldn't be able to get the game in. You know, this year we've had um, five JV or freshman games. Three of them have been at 5.30 through buses. Thank God we were on the road with teams that had lights because um, we don't have them. You know, the other thing is we do, we, to get games, we have to be very creative. We do some three-way team games. In other words, so three teams get together and you play half against each team so someone's not left out. And I kind of personally started that, bringing teams in here, but, you know, we started four in a couple weeks, you can't fit them in because it gets dark. You know, and the benefit of that was teams have allowed us then, when they're doing something, to let us come in and run the game. In two weeks, we're going to Hanover because we don't have a game. Hanover will let us come in for a JV three-way, but it starts at 5.30. They have lights. Uh, we don't have that ability. And I think really with this bus issue and trying to get into these JV games and field uses, it's, it's imperative that we really get those lights to do that. It's getting tougher and tougher every year. Um, you know, the other thing is for our varsity games, you know, we did a night game for uh, the last two years. We did a night game. Everyone that was there saw the community event that turned out. We had huge crowds, uh, young kids all the way up through. Uh, it was a great turnout. We did that for the Little Beeson game. Unfortunately, uh, portable lights are not a great avenue. Teams have to agree to play into those, and our opponents have told us that they won't play into those portable lights. It's just not really a very conducive atmosphere for the football. Um, I understand where they're coming from, and so unfortunately, we can't do that. Uh, Christian Beeson wanted to be at tonight, he has class till seven, but you know, Christian really talk about the community support that turned out in those night games. And, you know, a guy that wasn't part of football, uh, seeing just how big a community can come together in those evenings. And, uh, you know, and obviously it wasn't a one-off. The other thing is for football-wise, not just games with JV, varsity, but it's also practice. You know, when I first got here a long, long time ago, uh, the championship weekend was the first weekend in November. We used to have bringing temporary lights to practice. And then it went to the second week in November. And it gets dark early. You know, I used to go to Piper Construction, borrow a couple of lights if they had them, and try to practice under the air. You know, and then we went to the third week in November. Well, this year, championship weekend, we make it as the fourth weekend of November. It gets dark early. I mean, we can't even practice with lights. Our opponents that we are playing those games, they can practice. They, they're not limited by lights. You know, we're trying to we're trying to practice when it's dark and <coughs> try to go run game under the temporary lights. It is a disadvantage. And uh, I just think that, you know, I've, I've gone, I'll speak to it, the uh, soccer JV games, you know, they can't finish because it gets dark. Um, it is a thing, you know, and, and it's just times are changing and it's getting more and more unique. And I think we have to think outside the box a little bit and understand the overall benefits of life. It's not just, you know, we're talking about a Friday night football game, which is great, and I think the community will support that. But there's a lot of other things that go in there, a lot of other kids that are affected within our high school, within our community, and in all grades and all levels. But I just wanted to really speak up. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, everyone, uh, my name is Sarah Crane. I also live in the town of Plymouth. I have an eighth grader and a fifth grader, um, and I'm also here representing Plymouth Youth Lacrosse. Uh, basically, everything has already been said, but I just want to reiterate. I I think looking at my son coming here next year for high school, who is both a lacrosse player and a soccer player. The fact that JV girls and boys can't have full games and it gets dark and you can't practice and you have no flexibility, I think that's reason enough right there. Just the practice, the practice, flexibility for football, soccer, lacrosse. I mean, that soccer field out there has four sports that play on it in the spring and four sports that play on it in um, the fall. I think lights is a no-brainer and if it opens up usage for the community for other sports, I think that would be a really great benefit since, like Melissa said, um, many sports teams end up in 
a lot of random places trying to find practice space. Um, so, yeah, a big plus. It would be a big plus for this school. Um, I mean, just as an example of the whole bus thing, um, my son is playing in Berlin tomorrow at 5.30 because his game got changed from 4 because there's a bus. So, <laughs> lights, yes. Thanks, yes. My name is Pete Johnson. My grandson plays football for Coons. And uh, to give you some perspective, 20 years as a college and high school football official, not in New Hampshire. Did work in Texas, worked in Southern California, worked in Oregon, worked in Washington. They call it Friday Night Lights for a reason. Um, but what I want to point out is we're talking about whole athletes. We're talking about whole children. And the most impressive thing I've ever seen is how many kids I've known who are on the wrong path, got involved in athletics and improved in academics, improved in athletics, and improved in community service. A lot of that has to do with the community, and it has to do with the coaching. It doesn't matter the sport, lacrosse, soccer. I love football, obviously, so football. But what it really does is brings everybody together. What do lights have to do with that? Freshman leads to JV. JV leads to varsity. If your freshman and JV can't finish a game, male or female, doesn't matter, they don't get any more opportunities to move on up and they get kind of worn out and frustrated and challenged and then they don't make varsity. Eventually they, there's a drop off in nutrition. Let's look at making whole children and get them up to young adults and play varsity at a high level. One of the best ways to do that is have lights. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Great. Okay, thanks everyone. Approval of the minutes for September 3rd. Does anyone have any changes or say anything I did not? Yes, I need a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Great, thanks, Bonnie. Seconded Second. by Greg. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? No. Okay. So, student report Mason and Addie, welcome. Thank you. Um, I don't not hold too much. Um, I just want to start out with freshman elections. I know at the last meeting I let everyone know that we'd be having those the week after. So we got through those uh, on September 12th. We had elected all the positions for them except for two of their Senate seats, um, which we were able to fill in our first Senate meeting last Thursday. Um, that was our first Senate meeting of the year, which is a lot of just getting through uh, some starting stuff. So we elected our two chairs for Senate. Uh, so Claire Krutenberg and Anna Boyer, both uh, both seniors, are our two chairs, as well as our junior school board rep, which is Addie. So very exciting to get her here uh, and have another person on board. Uh, we also did some planning for what we want to do this year in Student Senate. Um, we have a big focus on student voice this year, especially regarding our new cell phone policy, uh, especially at the start of the year. That was a really big talking about people, and we want to this year have a focus on that kind of gauging. Um, kind of how, how students feel about it, different ways we can help support them um, or uh, recommend any changes to it. Um, so we're really excited about that. Uh, we also uh, are really excited to start working with some of our admin on our Bobcat blocks. Um, so right now for Mondays, um, we kind of just have a 35 minute period where not, not too much happens. We schedule for the Tuesday through Friday for that 35 minutes with teachers or if you have earned time, um, but right now we're kind of just in a 35 minute hole in that day where we don't have too much going on. Um, Senator Mrs. Eccleston and I have talked a lot about trying to use Student Senate um, and find a way that we can uh, fill something in there and have more going on, um, a lot more helpful things there. Uh, as well as trying to work with DECA this year, um, which is our business program. Uh, we really, the last year or so, have been trying to get vending machines back into our schools in a healthy way. Um, we've talked a lot about how that could uh, provide more access to students for if they want a snack throughout the day, um, some sort of healthy alternatives. Uh, so we've been, most of last year, was a big focus on doing research on how to uh, get that going again. And we have really wanted to work with DEC on that, because that also gives them a branch and uh, more business stuff with it as well. Uh, and then just to finish off, homecoming is this week. So two days in, we've had some fun dress-up days. Uh, yesterday we had Bobcat Day, so we were all of our Bobcat stuff for different sports and school spirit. Uh, today we had vacation day, so ski vacation, beach vacation, anything like that. 
tomorrow we have a very exciting Adam Sandler day, um, <laughs> which is very popular among students. Uh, we're really excited to see how that goes. We've not had a celebrity dress up day like that before or since I've been here, so very exciting. Uh, then on Thursday we have our class uh, theme day, so this year's music themes. Um, so I know seniors are country, juniors are rock and roll, um, and the other two are something. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have our the whole round off on Friday um, where we wear our class colors um, and really get the competitions going that day. Uh, we also have our food drive going right now. So every school, for every class is trying to get around to different schools. Um, gather as much donations as they can to turn them in, as well as our change war. So dimes, pen, no, dimes, nickels, and quarters, we're accepting no pennies, whichever team, or whichever class has the most weight at the end of tomorrow um, will win that. And then we, to finish it off, have our homecoming football game on Saturday. So very big, getting everyone out together for a big event. Um, very exciting way to, to round off homecoming and have a lot of schools group there. So that is everything. Great. Thanks, Mason, and welcome, Ed. Congratulations. Yeah. Okay. Principal's report. Thank you. Um, when I when I pulled my thoughts together, I didn't know I was going to echo the sentiment in the crowd as quite as much as I'm going to, but community seems to be the theme tonight. So I'm going to continue with that. Uh, because we really focused during the month of September on school community. So we did a lot of things to welcome new students back, welcome returning students back. We welcomed seven new teachers to this school community, and we reassigned three new administrators to new roles. So it was certainly a focus um, for our launch into this school year, and it really continued throughout the month of September as I look back, being October 1st today. Um, the students um, in many of our co-curricular uh, clubs organized a welcome week. Um, so two weeks ago, they welcome all students in different languages um, in, in the morning. There's also a variety of tables um, set up during the cafeteria in the cafeteria during lunch, and they're doing inclusive activities, welcome activities, and themes. I've learned handshakes. I played lots of trivia, um, but it's a really nice student-led opportunity, and it's it's the true focus of that of that one of the weeks in September. Um, we followed that up by our open house box schedule night, so it was a really great turnout. Um, we also partnered this year with some community organizations, so we invited Katie here, we invited Grown Roots, and we invited a representative from Tutor.com, which is a state and nationally recognized tutor services. Um, so they had tables. We opened up our Bobcat store for merchandise and people could get some merchandise out ahead of homecoming week. Um, and so we were excited about the turnout um, and we'll look to sort of include other resources in the future. Um, we also hosted a college mini fair for juniors and seniors. Um, we had 16 um, schools and universities here. Um, mostly New Hampshire schools, but two from kind of the greater New England area. Um, students um, in their juniors and senior year um, visited that fair during their Bobcat block. Um, and I would say that, you know, many of them walked away with maybe, res you know, things resonated with them that they knew and they had some new ahas going through there. Um, we also included three branches of, of the um, government, so there was a lot of opportunity for these kids to explore some of their post-secondary opportunities. Um, we also hosted a school, a, a guest speaker um, in the month of September. Um, his name is Mark Leanweaver. Um, he's a sports agent and he's a guest, a kind of a travels around the country and he really speaks on character. So we wove in um, the importance of having high character integrity, and he took the lens of the impact of social media and phones. So we are going to include student voice in this conversation around cell phones in schools and cell phones out of schools, and hope that we can use that block of time that Mason is speaking of. It's called advisory. We're going to look to include some activities and some student voice and, and get some feedback on how 
our students feel they're managing cell phones, social media, in their world. Um, so he, he was well received. Um, aside from that, just other business, you know, safety remains a top priority here at Plymouth. Um, I did want to congratulate publicly um, Officer Jill Bowen, and she did have a baby boy yesterday morning, so congratulations to her. But before she, she left, um, she has um, helped us conduct two of the ten required fire drills, um, one, two, um, two unplanned and one planned. Um, we've also moved forward with our emergency management team and sort of updated that plan as well. So she did a lot of um, really what she would have done throughout the fall in a short period of time. So I just wanted to thank her for all of her efforts before she left. Um, and last but not least for me, um, I did hand out to each board member at the top of the page it says NIAS. Um, and that is the organization that takes you through your high school accreditation process. Um, it's a 10-year process, but there's benchmarks along the way. And so this letter um, indicates that the report I submitted that's a reflection of the previous three years um, was voted um, yes. So they moved us um, and voted us to be a, an accredited high school. The bulleted list on that piece of paper is all the things that they're commending Plymouth High School for. Um, and I just wanted to, it's a little bit of language that you might not be familiar with, but during the teaching and learning committee is really when I'll try to highlight what the instructional coordinator team is doing and how we're making progress from the three-year plan to the six-year plan in regards to the accreditation process. So that's just a letter for your, for your reading. Upcoming dates, um, next Friday will be our first uh, full teacher and service day. I know you'd like to know some upcoming dates. Um, the fall play is the following week, the 18th and the 19th. Um, we will host um, the French and Spanish Honor Society induction, I believe. Um, that is on a Tuesday. I don't think we're in session, but either way, I know some of you like to know and attend. Um, and then in November, we'll look forward to our parent-teacher conference night on November 19th. That's it for me, unless there's questions. Any yeah, questions? No. Yes, Paul. How is the cell phone policy working out? Um, I, I would say overall, it's really working well. The biggest change that we've seen, so just let me review what we did. Um, I, I wanted to advocate for uninterrupted instructional time. And as the educational leader and the principal, I kind of feel like I had that right to at least advocate for that. Um, which means, essentially, for a kid, they're in a four by four, so four times of 80 minutes of instruction time, they would be phone free. But how do you do that, right? So at the administrative retreat, we decided that we would ask kids to remove that device from their body. So they have a choice when they get to class. They can either put it off and away in their backpack or we order pocket charts with numbers so that kids could slip their phone in like a private pocket chart. The teachers have bought in 100% to this and they have been creative in their own classrooms about how they're managing this, how the class starts, how the class ends, making sure everyone is following the rules. What we notice significantly is the is there's so many less kids in the hallway because there's no communication going on between kids during class time. And that is a significant <coughs> difference for us. And the kids who are in the hallway, by and large, are not on their phones. And, and, and it's just a, you know only 30 days of, of data. Um, but I would say that we, I, I wanted to move the needle in the right direction rather than have this massive change really fast. And I feel like the community has responded well to that approach. How are the students think going along okay? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna get input, um, but you know, the alternative is more restriction and more intervention. And without proper education about why we're doing this, I feel like I'd rather move a little bit slow and get better buy-in than move too quick and have people be resistant. So it is about educating them about the, the impacts that cell phones have on their lives, rather than kind of get into a tug of war with them. 
any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, our next committee meetings are October 15th. Kyla, do you want to have them report mm -hmm. out or just jump down to discussion items for Phil and for um, I, I think I would look to the chair if we everything that came out of committee, I don't know if you just want to update on some of the things that didn't come out of committee. Um, <coughs> Weren't you looking for a, were you looking for a motion on the policy? Yeah, I put it in discussion though. Oh, so okay. that's already that's already in there. I don't know, if Paul, if you just want to kind of review what Yeah, happened. absolutely. Okay. So we met on the seventeenth. Um, Todd, Liza, and Coach brought forward a significant amount of information regarding the athletic fields, turf light specifically. Uh, we had a pretty good discussion about that, and the board kept in mind and took into consideration you know, the reevaluation of taxes and everything and felt that leaving the turf in the committee for now would be the best option and move forward with the lights, which was brought to this board. Well, did you want to add? Uh, the only thing I would say is that. Uh, the board heard uh, the rationale for the proposal for graduation pathways. And I think, personally and professionally, that to have this graphic representation uh, of student options will really facilitate their decision making uh, along the way. Uh, it does reflect uh, the state minimum standards, which is obviously something we, we need to be doing. Um, and I. I Having this adopted, um, it, it really does show students, you know, when they come in as freshmen, you know, you know what they need to start thinking about and planning because, you know, the, when you get into the, so how many general electives are you going to take? Um, this really gives that graphic representation of that. So I think it's good work that the staff has done here at the school. Uh, to have that available. Um, so that, that's one piece of it. Um, the uh, policy, uh, so we kind of well spoke to the fact that the policy that was presented to us uh, basically is one that complies with state law and is uh, supported by um, the New Hampshire School Board Association because they develop a lot of the policies for all districts throughout the state. So it, it's one of the, I, I don't think we want to wordsmith or mess with too much because it, it has the legal legalese that we need to be in compliance with the law. Okay. Great. Thank you. Discussion items, restraint seclusion policy. So you're in your second reading um, of restraint and seclusion policy that came out of committee. Uh, this came into law last year and then you started with the first reading last year so it was delayed because we just didn't have any other committee meetings. So moving here, all the other schools have adopted this at this point. Remember that this historical piece of this law came from um, the fact that there was issues in the juvenile justice system or at the youth detention center of students being restrained um, for long periods of time or put in isolation. Um, for long periods of time without staff checking on them, without safety precautions in place. So really this, this piece of legislation came out of some of those reports. Um, some of it isn't relevant to the public school setting as much, but it is a blanket statute that we have to follow and we do have more kids with behavioral issues that safety precautions do need to be taken into consideration sometimes. And this just outlines the parameters in which we can implement that. Um, all staff is, you know, most of the staff that, or all the staff dealing with students that require this type of intervention are trained in certain areas and overseen and supervised very closely within the building. So it just updates. You had one several years ago that came through the state. This is just updated with the new language. And like I said, this policy is just covers that. What's, what's <coughs> under the statute? So if you're comfortable taking action on it tonight, that would be great. If not, we can um, move it one more month to a third reading, or it's up to you. Any questions for Kyla? Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Um, yes, Phil. I, if we're ready, I'd move that we adopt policy as presented and discussed. A second. second. Okay, Barbara wants a second. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstaining? Thank you. All right, and then the learning pathways. <coughs> 
All right, well. so from the committee, we talked about different pathways for kids, for students, as far as what they're going to be graduating with. You're going to have Neil Torino go over the work she's done within the building of the high school and would like to propose for action tonight kind of a pilot program down to the end of the year so we can tweak some of the systems for full implementation for the following year for, for all kids. We just want to make sure that it that it's, fits the parameters that we're looking for and, and accomplishes the goals uh, to extend some of our students' learning. So, yeah. Great. Thank you, Kyla. I just want to thank the Teaching and Learning Committee for moving this forward. Jill, I appreciate um, your summary, and I will probably repeat a little bit of what you said. Um, but um, I gave you all this um, this graphic, as Bill mentioned, alluded to. The green and red columns on the outside of the paper are what we're already doing. The green is our PRHS diploma, and the red is the New Hampshire State diploma. So the two pieces of information that we are looking for some feedback on are the honors pathway and the career ready pathway. To begin with, I want to acknowledge um, Kyle Reed, who is here tonight as our CTE director, because that career ready pathway, he'll be really instrumental in helping us move forward with that piece. And also Tom Lamb, Ann Pierce, and Julia O'Brien were the committee of um, faculty that I work with within the building to put together this proposal for you. It also it was really important for this committee to work together to maintain a goal of academic rigor while providing students with opportunities that align with our vision of a graduate. We've talked about the vision of the graduate a, a number of times here at school board and we want to keep that vision going and be able to really diversify and give our students what they need. So as I mentioned in committee, um, 16 seniors last year in the 23-24 school year would have already met the criteria for the honors diploma, which is really exciting. Um, and seven more were only missing one more component. So there's a potential of about 23 students <coughs> who could have graduated with this honors diploma, uh, or honors pathway rather. And there's approximately 18 current seniors eligible this year in our pilot year if they elect to apply for the pathway which is also really exciting. Something Phil did allude to as well is that with the honors pathway, students coming up from eighth grades are going to need to know, especially for the honors pathway, because that's more of a four-year trajectory, that they will have this opportunity to apply and need to know what is available to them from freshman year on. So this, if, if you move forward with this, we want to put it in the program of studies for them as well. Um, in terms of the career pathway, last year 79 students were completers of the CTE program, which is really exciting, and 32 students participated in an extended learning opportunity, so those students could have potentially um, earned this pathway <coughs> distinction. Just real quick, yeah, to know. With the extended learning opportunity, I think that the acronym you brought up last last month is what what's an ELO. So if we can't build, so we're often asked about building trades or trades in the community, whether it's like electrician, plumbing, HVAC, um, nursing, whatever whatever it may be. We don't have to have the program here. Um, we can we can send kids out to see if they like the trades that they're going into or like what they're going to go into into the post secondary or college before they get there and earn credit for it. Um, so at least they're able to get some of the trades. Some of the kids have already earned apprenticeship hours in high school um, and are ready to go as soon as they're done. So uh, that has been a real benefit to earning credit uh, just in different pathways of giving back to the local community. Right. So we do have a number of. Um, local communities, local partners, we call them community partners in our extended learning opportunities for students. So, And the community has been really receptive, which is also nice to see. Um, so this year we hope to graduate 112 CPE completers and three extended learning opportunity students who have met these current requirements uh, for the career ready pathway. So we have some really good numbers already in both of these pathway opportunities, so really hoping to um, when we are able to communicate this more broadly, that we'll have a really solid foundation of students who are interested. 
Again, we talked about last in time in committee that the students will be recognized upon graduation with a cord or a sash or some kind of distinction, and of course in the program as well, that they, that they took either this honors pathway or this career ready pathway. Do you have any questions? Yes, do people have questions about the pilot program that we would be exploring this coming year and then taking it from there mm -hmm. based on data and mm -hmm. results from the pilot program? <coughs> We're looking for approval tonight for pilot program the rest of the year. Do you have a motion? Yes. I would make a motion to pilot that for the rest of the year. I'll second. Second by Tony. All those in favor? <coughs> Proposed abstentions. All right, great, thank you. Athletic field light project. So just to put some context around kind of where we've been talking over the past um, year or two as far as what what do we need for the future. This really this conversation came out of our capital improvement plan. What are we looking at for facilities ten year ten years out? We look at the building, we look at the grounds. So as far as the grounds and what we need um, for our sports programs, we pitched at the committee, you know, what, I think there's always been a, a, a conversation around, you know, how, how much of the lights, is it going to be too much, is there a ledge, is there, do we need turf, do we not need turf? So the board decided last year to get an answer. How much is this going to actually cost us if we put lights on both fields and if we put turf on the, on the Surf uh, on the uh, sorry on the lacrosse and soccer field and then bring field hockey. Up. The cost of the turf was pretty significant, around 2.3 million dollars to come in. The lights for both fields all together on the high side was around. And correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, 750. 750,000. So uh, that's for both both sets of lights. Uh, so from committee, we had a lengthy discussion about the needs, and I'll have Todd kind of go, Todd Austin, our athletic director, go over the needs, and then I'll have Liza Taylor, our facilities, uh, head of facilities here at the high school, kind of go through all the logistics about the lights and what that includes um, for both fields as well. Uh, but from committee, um, the board's intent was to bring this to the full, full board for discussion with possibly some creative ways to fund this, um, or what ways you can it, whether it be on a warrant article, budget, what you have in retention, kind of to discuss this as a full group. So it didn't necessarily mean everyone's in support of that, but the whole board is going to listen to that tonight. You can have that discussion. Dan is here to go over some creative funding um, streams for you to think about as we move through the budget process. Okay? So I'll have Todd go over over just the last piece of it. Yep, thank you. Um, so Everybody over here did a great job explaining a lot of what's on my paper here, so I'm just going to touch on some of the um, stuff that hasn't already um, been brought up um, to save us some repetitiveness and some time. Uh, so, Coach Sanborn alluded to um, some of the travel at the end of the year. Uh, we tend to travel. Um, you mentioned we had to go to Saudi three times one year. At the end of the year, when it gets dark sooner, game starting at four. Um, Places that have lights, um, we can get down there. We can play. Uh, the busing has been um, increasingly harder to come by. Uh, we've had two games on the road where we've had to play at 5:30 due to our buses leaving late. Uh, this weekend we have. Um, I think it's going to be a great day. We have two soccer games on Saturday, um, along with our football game for our homecoming. Um, that really came about because John Stark High School cannot get buses to leave. Um, their town down where New Hampshire at, until 3:45. So those games were scheduled originally for Friday. Um, we just couldn't play on that day due to uh, not having lights. This year, um, more so than other years, we're playing back to back with soccer matches. Um, typically, in years past, we would play varsity on our field here, and home elementary school those who's there field for JV games they play simultaneously. This year, end of August, I got an email from the signer of officials saying in our area there's more of a shortage than in other places. Um, and he could not provide four officials to the rest of the game simultaneously. Um, we've already had some games cut short. Uh, 
Um, tonight, we're going to have a JV game starting soon. I keep trying to look at the time, but um, that game inevitably will be cut short tonight um, due to the fact that we do not have lights um, on our fields. Um, David James is here from the Huskies. Um, I don't believe he mentioned it, but um, their playoffs happen after daylight savings. The box gets switched. Um, last year I went down to a game in Derry, started at like 6 p.m. Um, it was a great game, but the Huskies, who have won multiple things, they've never been able to host playoffs um, in our own community. They always have to travel, for the, especially for the playoffs. Um, so that would be one uh, great benefit to having lights on the football field. Um, we've talked about practices, you know, um, bringing in lights from Piper. They've been a great um, community partner for us. When they have the lights available, they, they um, let us go get them, but um, it's just not sufficient. Um, practicing, if we had full lights, would be much, much better. Uh, one big thing, um, I haven't done any actual research on this, but it's a feeling I have and um, somebody mentioned our youth sports, they tend to um, go to other places to practice. And these other places are uh, pretty nice. You know, they get uh, turf over at Holderness. Sometimes they're down at uh, New Hampton. They go into the university. Um, so they have the lights and the turf. Uh, I feel sometimes we have kids that are, uh, become more interested in, in leaving to go to other like prep schools and things like that because when they're young and impressionable, they're on these fields and they're, they're like, well, this is, this is pretty nice. And, um, it's, it's fun to play at night um, under the lights. It's exciting. And you know, I, th I feel like we've lost some pretty good athletes due to that. Um, so you know, having the lights, it'll, it'll help you know, increase our time. We can have uh, practices. We can play these games from teams that have to travel. And I don't think it's going to get any better. It's going to get worse, I think, to travel. And the ref shortage, um, Mr. Johnson was a ref. The, the refs in our state, no offense to anybody, they're getting old. Um, and there's not a lot of youth um, movement coming underneath. Um, and the ref shortage is going to be something that we're going to be fighting against um, at a deeper level coming, coming up. So um, being able to have a couple games back to back, have enough light so we can play. JV kids get better, RC teams get better, um, all that. Um, it's all spelled out here. And then Mike is going to go over some of the logistical things, the cost, the, you know, and all that. Are there any questions before we move to Liza? No, thanks. So, um, of course, last time we met in the subcommittee, we talked a lot about the turf and a lot about the lights. And what I'd like to talk about tonight is obviously the cost. Um, we talked about the combined cost being $750,000. And what I had mentioned at the last meeting is still true. When given these quotes, the numbers I give to you are the high numbers. Uh, I'm not going to come in at a low number. I'm going to come in at the high number so that we don't have to come back later and say, well, why didn't you say that? that, that that's the high number. Um, <clears throat> what that includes is a 25-year warranty on these lights. And it's not just the lights, it's the bases, it's the poles, it's the wiring harness, the control cabinet, and the fixtures are all covered. They have someone who is on 24-7, a tech, if we were to run into any problems. And they also check these light systems every four hours. They do an, an actual, like, a, a Wi-Fi type ping to make sure that those lights are functioning the way they are supposed to. As far as maintenance on our end, every once in a great while, there'll be a fuse that needs to be replaced. Those fuses are located 12 feet up on the pole, and it's very simple. It lights up. It shows you which one you need to do. Um, very minimal maintenance. One of the things I asked about was, what's the life of these LED lights? How often am I going to have to change them out? And they said, quite honestly, you're not going to have to. Nine times out of ten, the LED lights will outlast the 25-year warranty on these. Each field would have four poles. On the football field, there'd be two on each, one on each side of the bleachers that are on the high end here. And on the opposing end, where the football tower is, there'd be one on each side there. Again, with the, the soccer field over here, those lights would be a little bit closer to the end zones, but again, still on the side there. We talked a little bit about ledge at the last meeting. 
I, I went back and I went through the research and I sent out an email and I said, have we talked about this? And I said, we assume that you have ledge. And that cost is, re that is why the cost is reflective of what it is. We don't know if it's at two feet or at eight feet, at eight feet but we actually designed the bases to go into ledge and we kept that in mind when we put those designs in. So those questions have been already built into that cost that you're looking at right there. One of the other things we discussed was the overspill of light. So the old lights, you remember, you pull into a, you know, a shop and save parking lot and you can see the lights just glowing everywhere. We were worried about the abutters right here. The thing is with these new LED lights versus the metal halide lights, which were the old lights, they have the ability to focus them just to the gameplay area. There will be a little bit of overspill. That's to be expected but it's going to be very minimal to no overspill into those neighbors uh, where we're at right now. If they're in their backyard and they look up at the field, they're going to be able to tell that there's a game going on, but it's not something that they would necessarily notice light shining in their windows or illuminating their backyard. Um, let's see what else do I have for you. So it's a, <clears throat> the, the bases are actually a precast concrete base. The poles are one piece, the wiring harness is one piece. So you don't have to worry about the wires being hooked together in the middle and something coming loose. That's, that's all taken care of. Um, what other things? What? Sorry, how, how much, much, how how much uh, per game to, to, how much is this gonna sure. add to the electric? So that was, uh, we did some research and the, the, the average is $9 for four hours to run these, to run these. So it's, it's pretty uh, cost, very, very minimal cost um, to run them. Um, and again, you know, the big thing was part of this system, they do have a tech 24 seven every single day um, of the year if we did need a problem and that is covered in the warranty. So if something should go wrong, they will be there. That cost is already taken care of. Just quickly on the timeline, mm -hmm. if, if, if the board decided to move to vote in March, uh, whichever way they do so. What's the timeline to do both fields? We could have, um, if, that, if that happens. Sure, if that vote were to happen in March, we could have both of those fields done for the fall sports. <coughs> Is there anything else that? The company. The company's been around for 48 years. They are the top in the country, and I think Todd can speak to how many different areas, um, local school districts that we know right here in, you know, the Lakes region that have used this company. Yeah, so Musco Lighting, it's a, it's a nationwide company. They do lights. I mean, they're in NFL stadiums, they're everywhere. Um, but locally, uh, the, the projects um, at, at Plum State University, they use Musco. Uh, Holdings Prep use Musco. Laconia High School. Um, Kingswood High School, you know, pretty much anybody that has a light tower on their fields has used muscle lighting. Um, it's the top, top of the line uh, company in, in the country. So. And so when they give us that 25 year warranty, that actually means something. They've been, a lot, they've been around almost double that time. And uh, they, they can speak to that. And I'll just have, thank you. Any questions for Liza? No. And then, Dan, if you want to go over some of the financial options that they would move forward. Sure. The <clears throat> um, clearly, uh, uh, my understanding coming out of committee is that the committee was recommending to the full board consider putting this on a warrant article. Certainly the most conventional um, way to have it approved. Um, once you make the decision to put it on the warrant article, you may want to explore various ways of funding that warrant article. So the, the most uh, simple would be what we call a some certain warrant article. We want seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to, or, or some no, number, different number, to light the, to state the purpose. If the warrant article is approved, it's a simple majority vote. It would be uh, built into the tax rate in the fall of twenty twenty five if we're on the March uh, warrant article. You also may want to uh, re reduce the impact if the board wanted to reduce the impact. They could commit some form of or some portion of a fund balance to offset. So for example, again, using the number $750,000, for example, you currently have about $328,000 in your retained fund balance. You could word the warrant article such that, 
uh, to raise and appropriate $750,000 for uh, athletic field lighting, $300,000 to come from the retained fund balance, $450,000 to come from taxation. And that would obviously have a different effect on the tax rate next fall. Um, you could stipulate that a portion would come from fund balance at the end of the current fiscal year. You could have all, you know, so 100,000 up to come from the current year's fund balance, 300,000 to come from the retained fund balance, and $350,000 to be raised through taxation. If you, know, if you wanted to get more complicated in terms of financing any portion of it, then you're gonna reach a threat, you're gonna have that uh, supermajority threshold that has to be approved, and you have to go through a whole different process for, for a, a, what's called a bond article. Um, but there are, that's only if you're gonna finance it, right? So uh, there are really a variety of options. Uh, we could talk about tax rate impacts if you want. We could talk about um, tax rate impacts under different scenarios, however you'd like the conversation to go. I just want to uh, support whatever uh, options you'd like to consider. I think what some of what the committee wanted was to see maybe talk about some of the tax rate impacts. Sure. Uh, that, was, that was common. Yeah, we can do that. Um, so let me, let me, let me um, pass around one example of what that would look like. Uh, for the board to think about. What makes it a little more complicated in this school versus, there should be a copy for everyone at the table. Um, what makes it a little bit more complicated at this school versus some of the other schools in SAU 48 is that the apportionment of this school's budget is spread out over seven towns versus a single town. And those towns have different tax bases, different net assessed valuations. So the, um, the, the tax rate impact it varies by town. And I'm just going to give it a minute for that sheet to finish its way around the table. Dan, yeah, can I ask you a quick question? Absolutely. In the last um, option that you said, you mentioned 100,000, 350, and 350. Can you just tell me what those were, like 100,000 from where? So it was just an example. Oh, you, it was, yeah, it was just an example. You could say, for example, you could word the article says, such as $100,000 to come from the FY25 fund balance. Okay. Yeah. Three hundred thousand to come from the retained fund balance from prior years, mm -hmm. and that would total four hundred. Yeah. And then three fifty to come from general taxation. Okay. So, uh, this spreadsheet that you now have in front of you is uh, clearly just showing, for example, the first example I gave was what we call the sum certain article. If you were to say we want seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to light the fields, there's no money coming from anywhere else. Mm -hmm. I have a dollar. In the upper right-hand corner, you see I have a dollar in each of those other two options, just mm -hmm. so the math works out. But on a net amount to assess of $749,998 or $750,000, if you look at the lower left-hand portion of the paper, you would see the tax rate impact next fall for each of the seven towns. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that's an approximation because it's based on the 2023 net assessed valuations. The 2024 ones are what we published this fall with the 2024 tax rates and obviously the 2025 numbers would probably change a little bit as well mm -hmm. but i i think we're within the five to seven percent range of what that tax rate impact would be for every dollar that you commit from either current year's funds or your prior year's fund balance that's going to reduce that tax rate impact because less is going to be raised in the fall of 2025 mm -hmm. again should the article be approved Does that make sense so I think what, 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 you know, the warrant won't be posted until January. So I think as we work our way through the second, the, you know, the, the second quarter of the fiscal year that we just started today, we can start to look at where our fund balance for the current year may wind up. We can do some projecting, both on expenses and revenues. We can take into consideration as we go through the budget season. I know you always, uh, at least the last several years, as, you, as you've had a retained fund balance, You've committed a portion of it to be a revenue next year to reduce the impact of next year's budget, but it can be part of the general budget conversation that's had as the warrant, as, as the operating budget for next year is developed, and as the warrant articles are finalized leading up to their posting in January. Okay. So the last example I'll give you just to, to, to final, finish up. So, for example, if you were to commit the entire fund balance from prior years. Mm -hmm. and raise the difference in taxes, essentially the tax rate impact in the lower left-hand corner would be half of that. So, for example, Ashland, it would be $0.08 cents on the Ashland tax rate because you're only raising 
half of the cost mm -hmm. versus using funds already in, on hand for the other half. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Great. Any questions for Dan? Thank you. I guess I'd like to see just a sense of what, how you feel about the project at this point as far as you don't have to make any decisions tonight, but just kind of questions or thoughts. Phil. I, first of all, I, I compliment the administration for the work they did to research. You've got, given us good information. I, I have confidence in the figures and what, what you've given, so thank you for that. I think there were, uh, with respect to the lights, there were two separate issues and uh, arguments, uh, separate arguments. I think the fall sports of soccer and field hockey uh, is one situation as opposed to the football. Um, the, with the number of teams you have in soccer, for example, um, yeah, you, it gets dark early. So, I, and I think there is, you've done a, the reality of it is there's better justification of need for the soccer, lacrosse, field hockey field uh, than football. And I, well, whatever the board decides, I would hope that they are kept separately. Uh, if, it's, if it is a warrant article, if that gets the support of the board, I think they should be separate articles. Because um, from what I've heard in the community, there are different points of view on what should get funded. Along the funding piece, um, whether they're on the warrant or in the budget, it all affects the bottom line when it comes time to paying taxes. Last year during budget season, we had a difficult time uh, getting down to the goal, board's goal of 3%. And if, if my memory is correct, we had to decide were we going to cut a science teacher or a special education person. Um, couldn't have both. And I think when you're looking at this type of expenditures, we ought to be focusing on things like student-teacher ratios. Um, because every year that, that is somewhat of an issue. Uh, the year before that, I think, was when we were looking at reducing the number of students in study halls. And to do that, we added a program. So I, I, I still, I personally do not feel, and having been associated with the football program here in one form or another for over four decades, um, I, I don't see the need. I understand the want, but I don't understand the need, especially when you weigh that against what the taxpayers are experiencing right now. Um, so I, I think they, again, I think they're two entirely different issues. Um, and I would have uh, certainly uh, significant trouble supporting uh, football field lights. Barbara. I have a question about cost. Uh, it's broken out nicely in totals, the 750000 But are those prices based on getting both fields at, at the same time, if we break it out, is each of those lines, or each of those lines different? If we were to do them as separate projects, meaning separate summers, that cost would be more. Yeah. You don't have, have, I don't have that number. Yeah, okay. Um, because they'd have to, as you know, with any project, you have to bring them back, you have to set the stations back up, you have to rehire so, you know, people, that, that cost would be more. If it Makes back. sense. Just if I could speak real quick just to Phil's comment as well. Um, I think we had talked about at the committee meeting as far as, you know, floating it as a, a warrant, art, so, warrant article so the townspeople can decide if they want it or not in addition to the, what, what's in the budget piece. But totally respect, respect that. We had also talked, Barbara had talked about having a hearing too in the past when we started ice hockey, um, even if there was no money attached to it, it was a warrant article to see if that's what the community wanted. So floating the warrant articles to see if that's what folks want above and beyond us is also just a consideration to, to have. Barbara. I'm just thinking, 
<clears throat> thinking this through a little bit, would it be okay if it came about to uh, put more than one warrant article out that would give the uh, public choices, like vote for both pro, uh, both fields at once? One field this year, one to follow as I, another warrant article. Is that make it harder to pass? Well, I, I think that's that's a, that's a discussion that we'll have to have further. I think, but I, yeah, you could have two different articles, or you can have one article. It all yeah. depends on the, the biggest thing you want to stay away from is compete is articles that compete with each yeah. other without being at all. So you could do one article for both of them. You could do two separate articles, one to address each field. Either way would be fine. Having an article that would negate a different article is going to be complex and problematic for, um, and, uh, among other things, it might be confusing at the polls, which I don't think you want, um, but also just uh, deciding if certain ones get approved and certain ones don't, how does that get interpreted would always be um, blurry. Yes, so process. Could we have a hearing? where we go through whatever anybody wants to submit for input and at that hearing suggest uh, both fields and see how that comes about. And then separate from that, we're not voting on the article, but we're getting a feel for the crowd. How about if we break it out? And then as a result of the discussion that night, then come forward with one article. <coughs> we can do that. Yeah, you can listen to the yeah. public and then. <clears throat> so there's. Yep. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, it's probably a question for Dan. Is the, what's the deadline for um, finalizing the warrant articles in regards to like how much time do we have in order to? So I don't have. I, I I'll get you an exact okay. date um, from uh, the DRA's website. In general, you're posting because you're an SB two community, so you're going to have you're going to post your warrant in advance of your mm -hmm. first deliberative session, which is in advance of voting day. So I'm, I'm, as I said, January during my initial statement, let me give you an exact day of when your warrant needs to be posted okay. this year. And that way you'll have I don't a- I need it right now. But yeah, then you have it sure. Tell us. Well, I just wanted to speak to what Phil had to say. Um, you know, I respect all the time you put in, Phil, here, but the last 10 years have been a lot different than the previous 30. Um, <clears throat> You know, in the time when you were coaching, we were coaching together. We never had a bus problem. We never had a, we had uh, never had a referee shortage. You know, everything was kind of running uh, smoothly. Um, since then, and especially since COVID, there's a lot of different problems that have arise um, with the busing, with the refs, and um, I fully agree that um, soccer is losing out on time that happens every every game as parents spoke about. Um, but we're losing out on time also with the JV and freshman football because we we can't play as many games as we used to do to that that travel restriction from other places. We've had the two games, thankfully where we were going, they had lights and we were able to play. Um, as you can see on the other sheet you know, there's only four schools that don't have lights in Division Two, so on the road we can usually get down there um, and get our games in on the road. But I feel like the whole project is just as important one field as the other, um, where one doesn't really take precedence over the other because we need that time for our JV kids to play. I may don't re quite remember what sport it was, but I remember hearing at the committee meeting that. Um, we had other schools that wouldn't play against us because we don't have lights. Is that so it's not that they wouldn't play because we don't have lights, but with the uh, football, last the t last two seasons we rented lights. Oh yes. Uh, yeah. We brought in ten light towers and <clears> set them all up. Um, <coughs> the schools are the lighting coming from those isn't real good for games. Yeah. To be honest, uh, they're, they're too <clears> low. Um, it's hard to see. The ball gets above the lights. There's a lot of things that happen yeah. um, in schools like Kennett who we played last year they said you know we appreciate what you guys are doing but we're not going to do that again we're not going to play mm -hmm. under those conditions um, so that's what we we're talking about when teams refuse to play it was what under the lights. yeah thank you 
Yes. Uh, I uh, understand the need for lights, and I think it's a good idea to have lights. But the way the economy is right now, I think you're, I mean, even 16 cents on a thousand for my town, our assessments went up 60%. So, but, you know, I I think we should go through the budget season, see if we can bring, if we're going to put on a warrant, see if we can reduce it a little bit. And then let the public decide that ultimately it's their decision. Mm -hmm. So no decisions need to be made tonight. I think we're going to be bringing the first draft of the budget to you shortly. If you consider that with the project, you listen to the public. I think those are all things to consider as we move forward into our budget season. Question. So once once we question in regards to the warrant article, we decide. Uh, after the, the say, like at the next meeting, we talk about the budget and stuff like that. Dan will help us with what we have available on the warrant article. Is that we present it saying we don't have the total on there, but we say what we are going to use or what we need. What how does it? I think that you can it will say whatever you choose it to say. So whether it all so comes word. from taxation or a portion of it comes from taxation, that's there's a couple different options you can. But we'll um, just decide that. At a, you don't have to do decide it. that today. You can look at the budget and say, okay, we're up, I don't, I don't know, say you're up 2% and then you want to float a warrant article. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then go from there and yeah. find what else you have as well. To answer your earlier question, if I may, Madam yeah. to answer your earlier question, uh, this, you, the warrant needs to be posted January 27th. So okay. you would want to finalize your warrant and no later than your January you know, your early January meeting okay. so that it could be properly uh, mm -hmm. signed and posted. Thank you. Yep. Yep. So I guess we'll um, keep this all in mind and um, possibly get creative in terms of separating both fields and one one year one and the other. We can look at that for the impact. And then, of course, a warrant article would be great because then you could really get a good read to your point, Barbara. On what the public wants, because at the end of the day, that's what we're all here for is what the public wants and what they are going to vote for. So we can see what curveballs hit us with budget season, because last year was not a pleasant one. Mm -hmm. This one could come at us that way as well, and all this can get pushed off again. But does anyone else have any thoughts or? That's good. So we'll. We'll I know I, I missed the, I missed a little bit of the beginning of the meeting. Did we talk about alternative funding sources, like grants and those types of things already? Has that stuff been? I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I missed it if I did. So. That's okay. 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 Came from this floor and somebody mentioned grants okay. that are available. Has that been looked into? I don't think it's been fully looked into. Um, it's still too early. We can look in the at that, into that as well. Um, and then as far as. Yeah. You're not aware of I am not. The only uh, electrical related grants I've been uh, familiar with are those where you're replacing existing lighting with more efficient lighting. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have a, a, a large project in one of our communities that's just wrapped, uh, you know, close to finished, that received a very large uh, rebate from the co op for converting from uh, a less efficient lighting system to a more efficient lighting system. Um, and we've seen that happen in a number of our schools. It happened in this school when a large renovation was done several years ago. But I am not aware. A, a woman from the, the audience did speak to a certain grant program she was aware of. Uh, I, believe, I know we have the meeting being recorded, so we can play that back and, and we can explore it. But I'm not here to tell. I, I can't advise you of any known grants that would support this project. Certainly, see if there's anything out Any sponsorship options and those types of things that might work. So. Yep, that's it. Sponsorship um, options is an is an option, um, but yeah, you you could you could have a public donation. You know, you, you could look for donations towards this program. The donations would have to be accepted by the board. Um, but there's a variety of other methods. You know, if you wanted to uh, change your position on advertising at the athletic fields. Um, that could be a source of revenue for you. Uh, there's there's a variety of options, but we can certainly talk more about it as you as your as your uh, 
position on it evolves either before or after any hearing you choose to have on the subject. What is our position on it? Yeah, I was going to say, can you, yeah, we probably have to that. Yeah. So it's a pretty old policy that there's no advertising allowed on the field. And so I've been more aware of it as we've traveled to different yeah. fields. And I notice every turf and light has have these banners that they either put out on the nights of the game and then take them down. Um, but you have no advertising rule on the, on the field. It's something I'd like to bring back to, to consider. Uh, you know, I understand that the, the optics of it, you don't want it to become too cluttered and you want to have some parameters mm -hmm. around that, but definitely most fields have sponsorships or, um, you know, for given a year to put up a sign for the game or something like that. It's something we might want to sunset that policy or- I think that just makes sense. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. There's a way to, it's not the old, so it comes from the old Coca-Cola scoreboards yes. in the middle schools that would be up there since like 1970 something and then they just leave it there and then, mm -hmm. you know, you're yeah. stuck with this advertisement there. So I think you could be creative just with marketing right now. There's all kinds of ways to, to honor sponsorship through social media, through, through mm -hmm. banners, through, some, you know, something temporary when games are around. So it's definitely something I'd like to bring back to committee. That sounds great. Point. Yeah, I think you know, if we're just right now we're just looking at taxpayer funds or our retained fund balance. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're it doesn't sound like we're being very creative. I think if we brought some of that creativity and introduce advertising that sort of thing, really just get up to speed, get up to date with trying to fund this kind of thing, I think it could happen. Mm -hmm. I think if you throw seven hundred fifty thousand dollars at the taxpayers, probably won't. But if we can find a creative way to fund this and make it a little softer. A blow a little softer, I think. I think it'll pass. But we definitely need to do some some homework and, and uh, get it fit properly mm -hmm. in that budget. And fundraising, what were have you guys thought about that too? I know that was mentioned at committee meeting. What might that look like, maybe to think of? And I'm putting you on the spot, but maybe <laughs> for our next meeting, you know something. Yeah, I mean, you know, with the fundraising. Other than just asking for donations, I think the best route is what Fred talked about, getting that advertising going. You can get a larger amount of money on an advertising, typically, than you could on a straight up donation. That would cost you against moving forward in that before you address your policy. Right. You don't want to be acting in contrary to yep. a policy that, that you have adopted. To, yeah. mm -hmm. I'll bring the policy to the next committee meeting so you can kind of work in tandem so it doesn't drop. Okay. Great. All right. Other business? Anything? No other business. No other business. All right. Great. Privilege of the floor, part two. Yes, Amy. Thanks. Um, thank you for the mock schedule night. I, as a new parent to my school, I thought it was really helpful and I appreciate you being with the teachers. So thank you for that. Thank you for the board for everything. School, so I know it's hard work, so I appreciate everything you yeah. do. Um, secondly, I literally just came from a meeting at the elementary school about social media, about students connecting and engaging. So I would hope that as a, a parent and the as school board chair that you would reach out to the elementary school because I literally just came from a community conversation that was happening at the elementary school. So I'm happy to hear that um, everyone's talking about it and I would love for the collaboration between the schools. Especially for students to get yeah. student views yeah. for, um, so if you were not aware of that, it's yeah. happening. So I would love for you guys to get. Yeah, we are connecting about that at okay. our principals meeting, so I was aware. So we're we're looking to partner with ascending schools in the future. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, I just had a question um, with regards to the lights. I don't know, maybe this is not something that the board answers, but um, if there is no ledge encountered, or if they don't have to pin the precast bases to lead, will there be a reduction in the light cost? So there's a range that we got. Um, the higher end is including the ledge. Yeah. So we went with our number that 750 is including the higher number <clears throat> with the expected ledge. And the answer is yes, it would be cheaper if there is no ledge. And are they covering like all aspects of ledge? Meaning? Like, like blasting, 
So they, they have, they're not going to need to blast. They have a way to. So they can pin. They drill and pin and they, and they secure it in a different way without blasting. So if there's no ledge, they don't have to secure it then that price would be. It's a little cheaper, yeah. Okay. There is a range. Can you know how much? Why is that? Yeah. Let me just pull that out. So the the lower range, uh, the soccer field is three hundred and fifteen thousand, and the football field is three hundred and ninety-five thousand. Uh, so forty thousand less for the total project. But we would still have to raise that, Dan, yes. and that difference won't hit us till the following year. Just to put that out there, so it's not like a checkbook mentality. It's it's still going to be, and then on the backside is revenues. Just to Point that out. I said something real quick too. So um, I hope that this goes to a board article. I, going back the past couple of years, I, I, I respect uh, the gentleman's boldness about needing and not needing. But I, uh, the past two years, I don't remember a board article failing when it comes to upgrading sort of equipment services. Um, Six hundred eighty-six thousand dollars was with solar panels back in 2023. Storage container of twelve thousand. Fire department radios forty thousand. Police cruiser fifty thousand. New skid steer for the transportation tra transfer station sixty thousand. New computers for the library ten thousand. Twenty twenty four new police cruiser sixty five thousand. Uh, fire department the, the lease on the uh, fire engine one hundred sixty one thousand dollars. CPR devices twenty two thousand. Uh, new plow truck for the highway department one hundred forty thousand. Taser equipment fifty six thousand. Police cameras for all the police for for the uh, for the police department thirty seven thousand. That total is one point three million dollars, and that adds eighty five cents. Now, I is if we if we approve if the warrant article went, would that would the seven fifty be spread among all of the towns? So uh, I think this is a question for yeah, me. Yeah. So, so so to be clear, the uh, the warrant articles you were just summarizing were That's on the, the Plymouth town. town. Correct. Yeah. So I I don't. Uh, where the, where but, the but, but the answer to your question, yes, is right. that any portion of the financial impact of this school right. is apportioned out amongst its seven member towns on a certain formula. Okay. And 50% on student uh, residency and 50% on the total value, uh, tax valuation of the town. Okay. So yes, it gets spread out amongst the seven towns. Got it. So just kind of addressing the need, do we need a new police cruiser every two years? No. Do we need new fire department radios? No. Do we need a new well, well, some of those out? were state mandated. Well, I think that it's just one of the, I, I, the, the town and the townspeople do have an appetite to make sure we have the best facilities for our student athletes. So I just don't, we, we do need lights at the football field. So I just would, I would just ask that we put it to the vote. I think, I, I, don't, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't pass. Um, again, I've never seen taxes go down. They're always going to go up, unfortunately. That's the way it is. Right, but I think when we're talking pennies on the dollar spread among the seven different towns, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't, wouldn't pass. I, we do, I just don't want to get into putting yeah. down the town to yeah. for our just, success. So yeah. I, don't, I don't think yeah, that's really. I, I wasn't able to see those numbers, but I was just able to go back and look yeah. at stuff today. So yeah. totally it's respect so that, but just putting some perspective out there. Anyone else? Yes. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Real quick, you know, um, I would just like everyone to consider the community impact that happens at these evening sports games with lights and everyone's here and it creates an amazing environment for families and our entire community, our kids, where everyone can be somewhere safe. And I'm sure all of you have been to an evening football game here at Plymouth and how wonderful that is. So I do think that there's that aspect in addition to everything that's been said. I mean, my daughter plays soccer and I watch the GV team get stopped, you know, all the time. So. It is an issue, it's a new issue, and my other suggestion is Moscow Lighting is probably very motivated to help us put these lights in and make that money, and I know that they are aware of grants, so they should be the first ones to be asked. Thanks, Brooke. Yep. Yes. My name is Becky Dunfock, and I am the president of the South Club, and I'm glad I followed your comment, because part of what I was going to say, um, well, first of all, I'm an educator, and I've been an educator for 20 years, and I'm also a soccer coach for that amount of time, a soccer player, et cetera, and my kids play in the community. Um, but I think my perspective here, through many lenses, but mostly the community perspective, and I'm like, what are we investing in? Are we investing 
is it just the money? Are we investing in our community as far as this is something that the kids can do together, that our teachers can do, that our parents can do, that our families can do. If there's a nighttime activity that's healthy and safe and fun, um, that's certainly what I want my kids to be doing when they get to high school. Um, the second part of that is it does involve, especially if you're talking about the football aspect of it, it doesn't just involve the football players and the football coaches and the football people, um, which I'm not much of one, but it does involve the the band or the dancers, if you have like a dance team or some sort of cheerleading type scenario. Um, so there's there's that piece as well. Um, and just because football is what it is, you're, if you're not playing back to back games, and those JV games are getting played during the week and not on our Saturdays. So there can't really be much shared um, personnel there. Um, the other thing I want to speak about my own um, my own program, the the Penny Baker Soccer Club. Um, and I could, of course, um, talk about like how our program could be immediately impacted by the lights. Um, but I think what I'm more worried about is the impact of the those children that are in our program right now in their future, and the fact that when they put all this time, and our coaches and our community members and all these volunteers, some of them are here tonight, put into our program, for years and years when these kids are kindergarten to eighth grade, and they get to high school, and there's no JV programs or freshman programs, which really isn't right now either, but JV programs to support some of those players that aren't as talented, um, then I, I feel like all that, that time and that community effort is wasted. And we do have generosity from a lot of towns letting us use, including Plymouth, where we play some of our games, um, but Ashland, Campton, Holderness, have been also extremely generous with, with their fields. Um, so to be able to support, this is like the, the home base would be, be huge as well. And the ref shortage is not a joke. We suffer it every weekend for County Baker Soccer Club, and that is just going to impact our JV programs um, for, for years. And unfortunately, one of the major impacts is on the girls program. Um, we've been working really hard in our program as Penny Baker Soccer Club to actually build the girls program. Those girls get in high school and they have they have nowhere to play. Um, that's kind of disheartening. Um, or they have somewhere to play, but they don't have the, the entire game to play in. That's also something they're not going to be that excited about. Um, so as far I, I, I mean, I think my big overall push for this would be a community perspective community has something, something that they can do together. Thank you. I have one other comment. Um, what about starting a referee program here at Plymouth um, and putting, pushing out some referees right here? Because you, you wouldn't get to be like 14 or 15 to be a referee. It's 13 or something. 13. So like, why not have some kind of program um, student-led maybe or something at Plymouth High School where we could get some referees out there and earning money. Yeah, so there, there are some, some of the referees association uh, promote that um, in the state. Um, you know, I, would, I wouldn't be against it, but we just need somebody to do it properly. You know? what, what do you mean someone like that? Uh, somebody that's, you know, a trained official that could teach the kids properly. I think it's know? really easy. I think you can just do like an online class and um, get some support. So anyway, I just think it's something to look into. Maybe there's some spare volunteers. Certainly. Yes. Steve Bev again. Um, I just want to comment on the impact on the taxes. Uh, in the town of Thornton, we just had five people lose their property, and um, it's because the the cost of education. Now, I want to be very clear. I'm 100% supportive of this idea. But I think the board should seriously look at um, funding this from some other source. Uh, I don't agree with the position that taxes must go up. Um, my community taxes went down. <coughs> the select board, not on the school side, but in Thornton, our tax rate actually went down. There's uh, 25 years that you're proposing to pay for this. I think it's a great idea to get outside of the box that you have yourselves in right now. If you get, get 10 businesses 
to put $3,000 away um, over the course of 25 years, you have paid for this project. So you should have a public partner, public uh, private partnership to pay for the project, and not put it on the backs of the taxpayers. Um, is my opinion. The the other thing is, um, you, you talked earlier, and I'm, I'm just wondering about the synergy of these uh, programs that you were talking about earlier, extended learning opportunities. So we have an electrical company that. We're dying in the, so I represent 70 equipment manufacturers. We cannot get people to work. I represent uh, equipment manufacturers in the HVAC industry, the plumbing industry, can't get anybody to work. Your report card came out. It wasn't awesome in the math and the science area. So you have an opportunity here, if you could be creative, to help the students and the electrical company and have a project done. <coughs> And, I, and I'll tell you that I've got multiple electricians that would love to have students in the school uh, trained. And right now, I think the conversion rate of non-post-secondary students is about 51%. So that means 49% of our students are going into the workforce. So you've got a great opportunity here at school board to uh, put together a creative program so that you can get the lighting to that uh, you know. I am partial to soccer. I went to Linwood High. I think football is a it's a pastime. It's not really a sport. You don't play against each other. You know, stupid size coach. Sorry about that. But, you know, the the uh, quarterback never faces the other quarterback. So the soccer teams absolutely need lighting, but there needs to be a creative way not to continue to spend uh, money. And we've got a lot of opportunity here. Okay. Everybody, great, great, thank you. Um, all right, consent items we passed around claims, payroll, and correspondence. Board member concerns, anything? Anybody? I am. Yes, Barbara. I'm so happy to see a lot of people coming to our meeting to give us input. Uh, it doesn't happen all the time, it hasn't happened a lot in years. And to that end, <laughs> I just wonder if we could maybe, if this is going to be a sign of things to come, have a portable hand uh, mic for anybody that wants to speak. I don't know how much we have to go through to get that here, but it might be well. Did you have a hard time hearing at that end of the room? There, there were some. And I think it's important that they do identify themselves, which they mostly have, and you know which town they represent or they live in, and then what their uh, opinion is or what they're presenting. And it, it would be helpful, I think, if they had a mic. Okay. If possible. We got it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. And I need a motion and state the why with the motions for for our non public session. Mm -hmm. Barbara? Okay. If we want to just list what we're going into for. Oh, what are we going in for? Um, I make a motion to go into non public session to discuss personnel and the legal items. Thanks, Barbara. Second by call. Oh, I'm going to do roll call. Personnel and what? Bob Bill, yeah. Sheila. Yeah.